Hey, product launchers, Tracy Hazard here, and I am so excited to bring you one of my favorite people on the earth because this is a woman of complete substance, right? This is depth through and through. Wendy Lipton Dibner, the impact strategy queen. She is amazing at the amount of research and data she has in her advice and consulting that she does with her clients. It is astounding, Wendy, and I'm talking to you because you're here, but it has been astounding to me to watch you run your events and do all of the things that you do because there is so much data behind everything you do. And I love that. That is a been there, done that again and again philosophy that I, you know, I love to reward. So that's why you're on the show. Well, thank you. I am so excited to be here with you. Finally, I love everything you guys do, and I can't wait to watch you in action. I'm just yours, <laughs> honey. Just use me. Let's go. <laughs> well, let's just start with impact strategy. What does that mean? Like, what's impact? I just want to start there, and then we'll dive back into your story because I love your story. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Okay. So let's start with impact because you know everyone uses the word. It's gotten to be as popular as the word love just about now, and so. <laughs> You know, I'm just a fiend for making sure we're talking about exactly what we need to be talking about. So the, there's a definition that we need to set out, right, Tracy? We need to make sure that everybody gets what we're talking about. So impact in my world is the measurable difference that we make in people's lives as the direct result of contact with us, our teams, our message, our marketing, our products, and our services. So when we put something into the world, the goal is that ultimately it's going to make a difference for people and that that difference will be measurable. So the strategy is how do we make that happen? How do we create the product? How do we innovate the product? How do we design a product, not just for market fit, but for market impact? Big right. And yeah. my audience here, you guys know, we always talk about product market fit matters the most out of and, and gets you the most opportunity for success. So it is the result of mismatch in product market, whether it's the product not fitting the market or the market, you having to find a market for your product, whether it's that, that's 56%, 56% of your opportunity for success lies right in getting that right. If you can get that right, then you're, you're 56% there. Then you need capital, team, other things matter, of course, but they're not as important as that getting that right first. So that impact and having an understanding of what that difference is. And that's where I think people don't always get it right? Us inventors in the world, like we, we want to make a difference so badly, but we sometimes don't really know how to measure that. Like it's our friends and family go, oh, that's wonderful. Like we really like it, but can we really measure it with the market? Like that's what really matters. So that's what you're talking about here. Yeah. So, so the cool part of this is that, you know, inventors and innovators and entrepreneurs, we all want to do something that's going to make a difference for someone that's going to make life easier or better or more fulfilling or less painful or more healthy or you know, whatever. But at the end of the day, we talk in generalities. We say, okay, so my product is designed for people who are looking to X, yeah. but not for people who are looking to get X out of Y. So that the more that we begin to nuance the real reason they need our product versus someone else, the real reason any of these products are in the world, right, is what is going to change for them in their life as a result of using that product. And the good news is that impact is the new global currency. So the more that we talk impact, the more that we by impact, I mean specifically tell people, when you use this, this is how your life will be different. And so what we're doing now is not selling the product, but the result, which is of course what sales is all about. Not features, not features, <laughs> benefits, exactly. life-changing, impactful benefits and measurable, like, you know, and your goal is to bring a lot more impact in the world. And I want to talk about that in a few minutes, but let's start back at your story. How did you come on this path of discovering that focusing on impact mattered so much? And by the way, if you can't see it in the background behind Wendy's head, there's her beautiful book, Focus on Impact. I think my copy is right behind my desk because I keep mine right behind me too. <laughs> I always have yours as a reference. It's one of my most dog-eared and highlighted books. Oh, thank you 
you so much. Yeah, that, that book has helped a lot of people. So I'm, I'm really glad you're using it. Yeah, um, it's so- chock full of details and charts and information and data and ways that which you came to all this. But tell us your story about how you really came to focusing on impact. Absolutely. So, so I think we all in some way want to know that what we're doing matters. Um, I, I just want to be Barbara Streisand. I wanted to sing and I wanted to, to affect people's lives, right? Um, but instead, I ended up in grad school. And what happened there was I published and I presented and I ended up getting recruited out, as you know, Tracy, to, to direct a major research study that was soft money. So I was trained in social research to look for what are the things that make a difference? What are the things that matter in organizations? And how can we use those things to uh, improve our organizations, to improve our impact, to improve our sales, et cetera? So as I was working on this major study of an alcoholism project, it was an alcoholism treatment facility. And it just so happened at that moment, the US Senate was putting together a committee to review all different diseases and which could be considered reimbursable. Now we talk about that every day, but this was back in the early 80s when people were just starting to talk about healthcare insurance and which um, problems should be reimbursed by healthcare and not. And alcoholism was a big question. Was it a disease? So they came to us to find out what did our study say. Fast forward, as we were getting ready to present to the Senate, which of course was like super exciting and super scary and all that kind of stuff. Um, Especially as a young girl. (laughs) 23. So my office was filled with attorneys that represented the hospital, wanting to make sure that everything we brought to the Senate would make the hospital look in its best light. Mm. And nothing illegal was done, nothing terrible was done. But what I learned very quickly is there's a big difference between legal and ethical, and they don't always match. Um, So let's not get political now, but let's focus on product. So what happened was the, we all went to Washington, but by the time we got there, the attorneys had changed a lot of the presentation that I had written. And if you've never heard the saying, if you torture the data enough, they'll confess to anything. Mm -hmm. And they they tortured that data. They added commas and periods and dashes and things that changed the nuance of truth and ethics. Um, So we were there. And as I stood up to present the presentation, picture, you know, all of the committee hearings that you see on TV now. All men back then. All men back then. Absolutely. And I was the only woman there. Uh, And when I went to read the study, it wasn't what I had written. And it was very uh, nerve wracking. And I had my first actual panic attack. It was awful. I didn't know what was happening to me. All I knew was I couldn't read those words. And in that moment, a lot flashed through my head. As you know, Tracy, we've talked about this a lot. Um, You know, what do you do at a moment of panic? What do you do when you want to make something happen that's important, but you know that if you follow this path, you're going to be walking down the path your boss wants you to walk down. And if you walk down this path, you're going to be walking down the path that feels right to you and you're going to lose your job. (laughs) <laughs> and it is a tough, tough choice to be making. It was, it was, you know, for all of your listeners who are inventing at two o'clock in the morning and then working the nine to five shift, you know, it, it, this is a hard decision. And in that moment, standing in front of the senators, uh, it, it seemed a bigger decision than, than every day for, you know, it was, oh my God, it was the Senate, right? So the long and short of the story is that I couldn't make myself read what they had written, but nobody knew the data better than me. So I just stood there holding the report and gave the truth, gave the data. Um, And as it happened, of course, the Senate did vote to go ahead and move forward with the fact that alcoholism was in fact a disease. And since then, millions of people have received coverage, which is awesome, right? So the right outcome happened. (laughs) Absolutely. But for me, it was also a right out 
come later at that moment, my boss and the attorneys were looking at me and I knew my job was done. And you know what? I was okay with that. You know, I, 23 years old, I, discov I discovered what ethical means. I discovered that making a difference, making an impact in people's lives was more important to me than anything. Um, that when you're so focused on money, it's easy to lose track of the impact that you want to make, that you are making, and you lose track of that. So I discovered that that day. I also discovered I can't be an employee. <laughs> well, you know, this is one of the things that have fascinated me about you is over time that you have when you decide you're going to research something, you immerse yourself in it. It's like you have this immersive research strategy, which I love. And so would you tell everyone the stories of your beauty parlors? Because that to me is like, that is the like, you know, diving in and learning on the job and figuring out how to make things better, how to improve things, how to make a difference every day. Absolutely. So, so I quit. Um, the university position, which if I hadn't, I'm not sure that I wouldn't have been helped. Um, and there I was with no job, no income, no idea what I was going to do. And so I did what every young woman my age did when you didn't know what to do. I went to get my hair done. <laughs> um, and my friend was a hairdresser and she came to my apartment and she brought wine with her. And I had given up drinking because I was studying alcoholism and it seemed a little weird that I was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I had not had a drink in a really long time. And so she brought this wine over and one glass, I mean, I was already feeling a little tipsy and by two or three, I didn't care what I was drinking. And we actually went through two bottles and I, I said, you know what? we should start our own beauty parlor. And it was a purely drunken statement. It had no... <laughs> I, I never nothing. heard this part of the story. I love oh, it. <laughs> Not this part. <laughs> I mean, nothing about it. I just, it just seemed like way more fun than what I'd been doing. Um, and the truth is she was miserable where she was working. So we chatted about it and we laughed about it. And then she went home and I took out the proverbial napkin and started to draw what would be a social laboratory. And I got all excited and I was gonna build a business that would have no mention of money whatsoever. That would prove that you could make more money focusing on making a difference in people's lives than by focusing on the products you wanted to sell. Um, I typed it up, I never slept that night. I went straight to the bank the next morning and told them my plan that I was focused on impact, that I had done this thing with the US Senate, and now I wanted to prove that the place for impact was in business and would they sponsor this new business that I was gonna open as a social laboratory. And they were thrilled with it and they went ahead and wrote me a check for $50,000 right then and there. And I walked out and I was so excited and I, I realized I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. But you know, uh, I just think that's so, like, this is part of what I want my women entrepreneurs out there. The, the, you guys take too long to yeah. take action. Please take advice from Wendy's confidence. Take, you know, admire it and do something with it because you take too long to bring your products to market. You take too long to get out there. You don't get the funding because you don't ask. And you're probably way more ready than you think you are. Oh, you know? listen, even if you're not ready, here's the only thing you need to be a hundred percent sure of is that you don't know what you're doing and that you will figure it out as you go. There are <laughs> always people there who will help you on the path. There weren't so much in those days though, but now there are. And what I can tell you is that when you are passionate about what you're doing and you have a really good idea, go for it. You'll figure it out. You don't have to have everything figured out. And here's the thing, even if you do have it all figured out, they'll mess with you. It it's won't work. <laughs> it won't be. You, something will change. Something will happen and you won't be able to do what you thought you were going to do anyway. So be open, have your idea, and let's take one step at a time, which is what I did. I love that. I so love that. Now, you learned so much in that business that you have you've applied, and I think a lot of those things that you learned really apply to product sales and product businesses and invention businesses. So would you give us some of the things you learned from that? Sure. Um, so one of the most important things I learned is that people need help saying yes 
to letting themselves have what they really want. Um, most people don't know that what they want is way beyond what you think the benefits are. So whatever your product is, whatever your service may be, whatever you're hoping to make happen in the world with your product, think beyond that. What will happen if someone gets the benefit that you want for them? How will their lives be different as a result, not just of your product, but of the benefits of your product? Because things keep happening in a domino-like fashion. And when we take time to think through the impact strategy, by that I mean, what are all of the things will happen in a ripple way that if this happens, then this happens, then this happens, then this happens for the people who use your products, then the conversation changes to more than just when you buy my X, it will make your life easier, right? Well, so what? If it makes it easier, then what will happen? And the more you really think it through, that's when everybody will light up and not only want your product, but use your product. And when they use your product, that's when the magic happens. Yeah, to me, the sign of a really great product is one that gets used again and again. Yes. And then raved about later. Like that's yes. like, it's, that's, that's to me the sign of a great product. Exactly. Exactly. And the best is when you don't even have to say anything because your friends start saying, what are you on? Is it legal? And can I have <laughs> Exactly. I need that. They just know you're, you look great. You look alive. You're, you're excited. You're happy. You're not being all crabby in the middle of your dinner party. And you're like, Oh, it's because I have my new cut a gadget and my cut a gadget made all my time in the kitchen more fun. And oh my God, it's just fun. You want to try one? And the next thing you know, the friend is making the salad and you're moving on doing something else. It's awesome. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. So you have a big event coming up and I don't want to miss talking about it because I mean, you've got some, I mean, I, I went last year and I have to tell you that I think most of your audience wasn't at the stage of business to go, oh my God, that's so brilliant. And, and there's so much packed into it. So I feel like you have to come again and again. Like, cause, are, cause this year, right. right. And I'm coming back again because yeah, this is the thing. It's like layers. Like my business is ready for all of these things, but next time there'll be a whole nother set of things that I'm ready for. And I, I love that about it. It's like, you don't dumb it down. Like, it's not like I'm going for the simple thing. You go for the whole thing, yeah. all the things people need to know. So tell us more about the event. Okay. I'd love to. Thank you. So the event is move people to action. Um, and what it really is, is how ethical influence guided me to build 10 different businesses, to create lots of different products and services, and to help my clients, right, make hundreds of millions of dollars for their products and services. And the deal is that I couldn't pick one thing to teach because it isn't just one thing. It's, it's wherever you are now, you need this thing. And if you use this thing, then you're going to need that thing. But what if you already have that thing? Then you really need this thing. But did you ever do this thing? Because if you had done this thing, that thing would be going better now. So let's go back and do that. And then at that. So it's uh, way more organized than it sounds. But no, it's totally organized. Because if you can see over her other shoulder, you'll see her roadmap. So yes. it's organized in a roadmap, which is, we, this is the one thing when we, bit, when we met for the first time, I was like, there was so much overlap in, and our, we do a microcosm of what you do because we're working on only the product launch part of it. And like, that's a whole business launch plan, right. but it's the same process because the order matters. And this is what I try to get across to product launchers all the time. If you do the right things in the right order with the right resources, you have a higher likelihood for success. And that's your acceleration plan, right? You're exactly. going to go. Yeah. Exactly. So now, what do you, your, your map, what do you call your map? I forgot. Well, there's actually two different maps, right? That's right. So there's the focus on impact map, which is the 10 step path to go from idea to new idea and all the way back again. So because we have to have continual new ideas in our business, right? We have to have continual new products in our product line. It just has to happen. That's right. And because our brains are crazy enough to do it anyway, so we might as well make a path for it, right? That's right. <laughs> uh, so that's the business model. But within the business, the overall impact strategy business model comes step by step according to who do you need to do something so you can do what you want? Who do you need 
to do this so you can get what you want. You know, the, the move people to action map is really your missing link to more. So it's just a question of what do you want more of? More customers, more ideas, more speaking engagements, more product space, more shelf space. What do you want more of? And the more that you think about that, you start to think about team, employees, I want more vacations, I want more money, move away from that. Move to what are all the things that will get you that. Move people to action is the map to make that happen. Oh, I love it. And one of the things that, you know, is occurring to me as we're talking is that you also have a really big mission on, and a lot of our product launches fall into this realm, that there is no age limit to building a business. Oh. And I love that this is such a part of it. You, th- you, you believe that the more gray hair, and some of us hide it really well, because we're a lot older than we look, but we hide it really well, right? And, um, but that, that, is, that is why you should be doing business. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, with pleasure. So in fact, just this last weekend, I did a retreat for a group that I call my Vintage Venturists. I love that title. (laughs) Uh, They're all over 70. They um, have a lifetime of experience and creativity and innovation already behind them. And the question is, what did they not invent? that they missed because they were so busy building these other things. And so we pulled them all together and they were here um, all weekend. We were doing a three day, like morning, day and night marathon to get their products to the next level. Uh, it was really exciting. New ideas, new new plans, everything moving so that they st- one of two of them came to me to write a book, Tracy. And now we're putting together what we anticipate will be a $130 million app. So, <laughs> so forget, no, a, forget a book that's not even going to sell $130,000 worth of books, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and one of them said to me, you know, honey, at my age, what do I need $130 million for? And I, cool. What's cool. the impact? Give it away. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean. So, so whether you keep the money or give the money away or, you know, use it for tips, I don't care. At the end of the day, your ultimate legacy is going out in product format and it's going to be amazing. And they tell me that every year they've been working on these projects, they feel like they've lost another five to 10 years of aging. So they're doing more physically young again. I love it. Gosh, they're going on dates with their husbands. I mean, it's amazing to watch. (laughs) Well, I love it because I think this is the thing, especially like, as I mentioned before, we see a lot of women and there are a lot of women in your group that I have met that have much more, um, resume than anyone in, or CV, depending on which country you're coming from, right? But yeah. much more than anyone I've ever met, they are way overqualified to be doing these things already. And the fact that they have taken so long to do them is just because they didn't have the support system. They didn't have the know-how that they could do this, that this was important. Them, that family came first. Mm. Yeah. So, or jobs came first. They didn't see themselves as entrepreneurs. They played the game that everyone told them they were supposed to play. And then all of a sudden, all the kids and the grandkids have moved on. They're not working anymore. And the question, they're not ready to die. So now what? Right? Now's the time for me, for my staff, for my ideas. I love that. I just think it's amazing. But I also think this is the thing is that it should be more investable. It should be easier for them to get money because they are so qualified. Yes, and it's, it's harder. It's and it's enough. harder, which is just so wrong. Yeah. Because the number one thing I hear from venture groups and angel investors is that, you know, qualifications and capabilities and character matters, right? right. Who doesn't have the most of that? They've got proven track records, right? That's right. Yeah. So we're, working on that. we're working on that. Because I know you are. Because <laughs> at the end of the day, while the founder is crucial in terms of giving credibility and making sure that this moves forward, as long as the founder is surrounded by a support system of people who are ready to really help them get it out there, then once the idea has been intellectualized and and turned into something real, that's what matters. That's what matters. 
So yeah, I'm excited about this for them, but I'm also excited for the 20 year olds. Yeah. You know, for, for the people who, who maybe don't have credentials or, or experience or don't even quite know what a CV is. Um, but what they know is they see a problem, Tracy. Yeah. You know, they see a problem. And if you see a problem and you've got an idea to fix it, that's what you need. Everybody else around you, especially this woman sitting right there that you're looking at, can help you productize it. Yeah. The idea is you've got to see the problem that nobody sees and, in, and a way of solving it in a way that no one has done. And that's it. Yeah. And I even tell you that, tell people all the time that there is, you don't have to have this giant disruptive idea because there are lots of market making ideas, right? So if you see, we, I just gave a talk on this in Salt Lake City and, and this is really the focus of it is that there are so, so much more chances of success in a market making business. So in other words, if Amazon is a market making business, they didn't disrupt retail. Retail did that on its own. It just, they went along on the wave of it happening. Um, Brian Smith of Uggs was there and he was giving his talk and he was talking about like, Uggs struggled for 12 years. I mean, and, you, we, and he would go to the bank every year and they would go, we think it's a fad. This is the last year. We're not going to give you enough money to fund the orders that you're sitting there holding in your hand. Right. And he was like, I don't understand this. And he's pulling his hair out of this. Why is this so hard to grow a business, to grow a brand? Right. And so he was so frustrated by it. And it was just a tipping point that a bunch of sheepskin products came on the market and Uggs was the top of the list, the, the cream of the crop. And they just rode that wave and accelerated off. And then everything got easy after that. And Reeboks that way. Nike is that way. They built for years and years before they got, they got famous. So market making rides a wave of other companies coming on. So you don't have to have something so disruptive and original. You just have to have something that's, that really solves a problem and better than anyone else on top of this market shift that's happening. And if I can add something to that, please, you're right. Um, <laughs> you have to know how to talk about it in a yeah. way that moves people to action, in a way that that lights people up and say, "Oh my gosh, you know, why didn't anybody ever think of it this way?" And there's 47 different breakfast cereals on the shelf, but the way that you talked about yours in terms of the impact that it would make to families' lives. All of a sudden, they're saying, wow, I never thought of it that way. So you're absolutely right. The, the innovation a lot of the time is how we perceive our product will make a dent. Yep. Yeah, how it's going to change everybody's lives, how it's going to improve them, what impact is it going to have? So that's, you know, that is your message, Wendy. And I, it is why I'm such a fan and everyone. And yeah, and you know, I'm a big reader. So I actually read your book from cover to cover, right? And I highly recommend it for you tech people out there. The ones that are, you know, my engineers who are watching this, those inventors, there's so much nuggets of stuff that will, will, will convince you that each one of these steps, the order of them matter there, there's this thing that we learn when we're just developing products, when we're developing code, for those of you who are out there doing tech products, that redo, having to go back to the beginning and redo because we learned something and now we have to go back to the beginning. This is the biggest cause of delay and the biggest reason products don't make it to market fast enough. And so Wendy's got the formula. She's got the path. It works. It works in all types of businesses too. This is you've, you've discovered as well. You researched really hard. Can you mention a little bit about the types of businesses it works in? Sure. Okay. So um, if, if there's an industry around the business, that's what it works in. Uh, what I have discovered, not by design originally, uh, was that there is no industry from technology to trucking, um, telephones, right? Uh, uh, for, we started in the old days in term in the old days. Oh my God, how did I get old enough to say in the old days? <laughs> I just totally channeled my grandmother, right? So um, long, long time ago in a land far, far away when people were talking about telephones in terms of the systems that offices would buy, right? How, how could they innovate those sim systems? And then the next thing we knew, they were walking around carrying this enormous box and telling us this was the newest thing. It was called cellular telephones, and you needed a cart to carry the stuff. <laughs> yeah, it was really big. In your car, but you had to make room for it. You couldn't just like, 
Um, so that, that's, I mean, I was there, right? I was there with the phone company working as their consultant when they were first coming out with this. And one of the things that I was amazed by, I mean, seriously, Tracy, nobody was more surprised about this than I was, was that the strategies that I had used to move people to action in the salons and in the brokerage houses and in the service-driven companies were now suddenly even stronger for the product-driven companies. So for laundry detergents, for um, telephones, for trucking, for shipping, for uh, telephones of every size and utility, for gas companies, for the, for the actual pipes that were being created for the gas companies. Um, the, health and wellness. You've done a lot in oh, health and wellness. A lot, yeah. a lot. Yeah, I, I ended up, um, again, by default, not by design, um, helping doctors in their practices and helping them to innovate, innovate medical um, instruments and products um, that would make a bigger difference, new protocols for ways of providing services for patients. And the more that we, we look at people in terms of what have they got that they're not using, that's the first step to innovation because in my mind, you saw that they bought it in the first place. So clearly they were looking for something, right. but why didn't they use it? I'd love to see people do an entire research study, Tracy, Tracy, Tracy. Yeah. <laughs> what are the products that are out there that people aren't using and why? Yeah, well, they buy them and they end up, you know, well, there's a couple of new companies, Parachute is one of them, where you can send all your camera equipment and stuff that you, That's camera right. video equipment, yeah, that you uh, you just bought and it keeps in the garage and you've never used it. And so, like, there are companies out there doing repurposing of those things. So, at least that will get to an audience that uses it. But why don't you? Absolutely. So, I always think that studying misuse is also the other thing, which ties into the, the one major thing we always try to hit on this show, which is obviously the hazards, the single Z hazards of not doing the right things in the right order with the right resources. So I would love for you to give me some of the top things that you think are, like really go wrong for, for entrepreneurs, especially product ones. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Do I have, uh, okay. I was just using this for my dog. All right. So this is the map you guys, All right? I don't know. Yep. Can you see that Trace? Yep. We can see it. All right. So this is the map. And the first thing you do wrong is you go out of order right? Sequence is everything. And that's what, of course, Tracy was saying. So when you go out of order, what does that mean? What should the order be? Well, before you pick up a pencil or a tablet to design an idea, the first thing you've got to decide from my perspective is what is the measurable difference this idea will have? Because as soon as you figure out what is the measurable difference you want it to have, and by that, I mean the impact, right? you start thinking of it differently in your design. Mm. If the ultimate difference is X and you know that, then you will design it to make that happen. And that's different than I want to design a new light bulb. Fine. What is the ultimate difference you want that light bulb to make in people's lives? What will they be doing differently? What will they get differently? What will they have differently? What will they be differently? differently the, as a result of using, I speak for a living, um, as a result of using your new light bulb, you know, so the question is, did you do that first? And if you didn't do that first, it's not too late. Now is the time to go back, as Tracy said, and do the redo and go back and look at why are you doing this? What is it designed to do? And what do you wish you had designed it to do? Because it's not too late. You haven't put it out yet. Yeah. You know, and that's, I, you're, you're right on. And the, the thing about it that I love about the way you describe it too is, is that it also gives you what I call the key criteria. So you don't lose sight of what's important because the design process and the development process and the engineering process is really technical. And all of a sudden you find you designed something out or you chose to let it out because cost was too high and, you know, and you don't have anything to measure against of, am I succeeding and getting where I want to go? If you don't establish that key criteria from the beginning. So it is really, is like, what is the most important thing that I need to accomplish with that and keep your eye on that. So a lot of people go for what they call minimum viable product. And I think it's, that that's a hated term here. We don't like that. We talk. Yeah. We, yeah. Maximum valuable product, right? That's what I, it's still an MVP, different MVP. <laughs> don't do it in terms of cost. I know that sounds crazy, but you've got to forget about money and focus on impact. 
um, and I'm not saying this as a woo-woo thing. I'm saying this as the result, and Tracy, you know about this research, um, of a thousand plus of my clients, fortune, healthcare, nonprofit, small business, solopreneur products. And what we looked at was when I found the client, what were they focusing on? And how could we make it that they would make more money because they brought me in because they wanted to make more money. Let's get clear about that. So that was their number one goal. And when we looked at what they were focusing on in order to make more money, they were focusing on money. In other words, what are we spending for our X, whatever that is, right? Team, products, manufacturing, distribution, you name it. What are we spending for consultants? Wendy, what are we paying you? You know, all of these different things that they were so focused on. And what we discovered in this study were the companies that spent the most time focusing on money were actually spending more money than the companies that didn't. What were they spending the money on? On making up for the mistakes they made because they were so focused on money. <laughs> oh, I love I love that secular go bite them right back in the butt on that one. <laughs> yeah, it you know, seemed like a good idea at the time kind of thing. And, and it, it makes sense. I mean, by definition, business is about making money, right? But if all of your focus is on money and you forget about the most important piece is which is will people use what you're creating? In other words, what is the impact it will create? And how will it happen? It will happen by people using it. So how do we move them to use it? Not how do we move them to buy it? And the more that you start thinking about that, you start realizing, you know what? They're not going to use this because I didn't do this. So let's relook at this. Because if, they, if this thing weighs 20 pounds and it has to be used by a child, what are the odds that the child is going to use it? So at the end of this whole thing, it's all about who will use it and what would move them to use it excitedly so that they would get all of the results that you wanted them to get in the first place. When we looked at that, when we focused those companies and refocused everything internally and externally, everything from how they think to the marketing they use and all of the design in between, they increased revenues by minimally 200% and typically in less than 30 days. Wow, that is such great <laughs> results. I mean, uh, uh, so I know I have some businesses out there that especially some of these brand builders that are on our platform who are going to want to reach out to you. So again, everyone, you know that you can go to uh, productlaunchhazards.com. You can go to this episode. You can go to the video. You can find all the details on how to get to Wendy. But most importantly in there, I'm going to have all the links to her event. And all the links to her group there as well. And we've got a coupon and discount for you. So if you want to attend this event, I can tell you that your event was my favorite of the last year, of this whole year. Thank you. Thank you. I, 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 had, I learned the most. And it is, I, I've been to, I go to events all the time because I speak. And, you know, occasionally I get my nuggets of information and everything. But I, I, I had a whole notebook full. And so, yeah. And so when I can learn something, this means that you guys can really learn something you've not heard before. And that is very valuable. So I invite you to connect with Wendy um, in any way, shape or form that you would like. Can I do the same in reverse? Um, here's the thing, you guys. First of all, Tracy's coming to this event. So if you're coming, let Tracy know. And maybe yeah. you guys could do like a dinner together or something. That Absolutely. Would be I would love to have a mentorship dinner. So while we're there, thank you for offering that <laughs> on my behalf. <laughs> no, I would love to. I, you know, I've been thinking more and more I have to do that because as I was in Hong Kong recently, there were all these people like, oh, I listened to your show. And I was like, I should have said I'm going to come and so that people would know to connect with me. I'm going to do better next year. So there you go. <laughs> Wendy's pushing me. Great way to start the year. Um, the other thing, you guys, even if you're listening to this long past January, um, one of the things that, that I really personally want you to know is that Tracy is the only one I send my clients to now who are productizing ideas. Um, and I have a, a lot of choices of people that I've met through the years that I can use. And I only refer them to Tracy. And there's a reason for that because I've had Tracy sitting in my office on my couch and we have spent time together and we have broken bread together and anything else that has calories in it. And <laughs> at the end of the day, what we've discovered is that while Tracy will talk to you very strongly 
um, about, you know, do this and do this and do this. And she comes across as this amazingly powerfully competent woman. What you need to know is her heart is in the right place. Um, and Thank you. <laughs> and ethics are my thing. And I trust you. I trust you with my friendship, but more importantly, for, for the purpose of this, I trust you with the people who I take in my hands, right? I trust you with their impact. And I'm so grateful that you are on this planet, Tracy. You have no idea. Oh, thank you so much. I am so blessed to know you and Hal. And Hal, is her, Hal Divner is her husband. And we, you get to meet him. You are going to love him just as much as you love Wendy because he is a charmer. <laughs> he truly is. And I love that he comes to your events and supports you in the way that he does and supports all the people there. So that is also special. So this is the thing when, when I adore working with Wendy and Hal because this is a couple and you're co-creating together and Tom and I co-create together. And so that means a lot to us as well. Um, but thank you so much for saying that and, and so appreciate that. And this is a thing that I really believe in. And this is what Product Launch Hazards is all about. Here is, we're about creating a collaborative community that provides all of the bases you need to cover. And so when you're on this big brand builder, then Wendy's the first person I'm going to send you to because I want to make sure you have, you have the opportunity to maximize what you're doing. So when I see it in that world, I go, we got to send you someplace where you're going to have the right view of where you need to go from the beginning. And that is so critically important too. So thank you so much for being on the show today, Wendy. I really appreciate it. It's been so much fun to get catch up with you. Thank you. And thank you for doing this show. I love everything you guys do. And thank you for the impact you bring the world, Tracy. Thanks so much. So product launchers, you can find everything about Wendy Lipton Dibner at the podcast, at the podcast uh, episode show notes, which is on productlaunchhazards.com. Thanks again for listening. This has been Tracy and Wendy.